another OKD working group and share my screen and grab the grab the let me see where I have this here. Another one. Nope, 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 nope. OKD working group link. Back to sharing. And this is the bit that I always end up cutting off at the beginning while we get ourselves set up. But if you could sign in, that would be great. And um, I will motor on here and share my screen. We've got quite a uh, kind of few people coming. Summertime here, yeah, maybe killing a few things. Hey, Neil. Welcome, Bruce. Everybody, hello. There you go. Um, and I know Joseph, uh, you and, and Philip joined an hour early. You get the prize for um, not getting with the uh, daylight savings time still. Um, so welcome, Philip. And um, I today, this time I decided not to open a second, an earlier session just to catch all of you. But hey, um, you still came. So <laughs> thanks. Um, so yeah, today um, we have a, a new stable release out. I'm gonna share my screen so we just sort of drive through the um, team working group uh, meeting. So um, as I, I like to do is to put Vadim on the, st um, the spot to uh, talk about the latest release and any issues people are finding. So Vadim, if you could take it away and, and start us off with that, that would be great. Um, sure. Uh, this release, the release this weekend, has been mostly accumulating a few fixes, most notably the fix for IPs misbehaving in Network Manager. That seems to be resolved now. Um, however, due to changes in Fedora Core at Stable, they have switched to use Podman 3x. That thing is probably very nice, but it has a serious issue. So. If you try to use the latest stable Fedora Core OS as an initial starting point, you would fail because it has a bug when it copies the initial payload. So we recommend you, you to use previous stable. Another issue we've had was that during upgrade process, if you're using a fake pull secret, uh, machine config daemon would first attempt to use OC, and if the pull secret is invalid, as in um, you're not using a base64 part in the authentication section. It would fall back to Podman and try to do the Podman copy again. That would fail. So we have a bug file to that. And the workaround is simply to use a valid base64 part in the pull secret. So we have merged the pull request, which recommends creating a valid pull secret. And um, and that's kind of uh, the only thing we can do right for now. Um, apart from that, I think that's pretty much it from the technical standpoint. So um, just for me, because I haven't tried anything um, with the latest release, uh, is there a, a stable release of Fedora Core OS that we should be using? Um, an earlier one with this release of OKD? Yep. Is, is that the one from February is a great starting point. Again. It's irrelevant for those who are updating because you don't need anything else. Okay. Is it okay if uh, during the upgrade we still get this March uh, release? Because I yes. saw the. Okay. It's yeah, only the, the bootstrap that fails with the yeah. March release. So if you are okay. not in a time, if you're not doing something that requires you to rebootstrap the cluster, then you're fine. Well, Absolutely. Unless, you're, unless you're doing an upgrade and you have a bad and you're using a fake key and it doesn't have a good base 64 and then it will fail also. Yeah. So that's the caveat that we worked on this morning and finally figured out. Yeah, yeah no, it's a good time right, to yeah. update to make, to make the pull secret finally valid. All right. yep. and... Yeah, making a valid pull secret probably is just a good idea. In general. Well, there's a good example in the documentation now uh, that's a, a valid pull <laughs> secret. The one that was there before wasn't valid. Where does the fake secret come from? From the install config YAML? Or is it created by the uh, installer? That well, comes from the formatting. Install. It's still fake. It's still fake. Yeah. It's just, it was just not correctly formatted. It used to not validate the formatting, 
Now right. it does, and it chokes on it. Right. So we now so make the, the big secret yeah, directly the, for me. Basically, the base64 has to be username, fake username, colon, fake password, and then you base64 that, and it works yeah. fine. I always was wondering about this one. <laughs> yep. Well, it worked for a long matter, time. Just the structure. <laughs> so we have to update before we upgrade? We have to change the pull secret if, if it's a fake one. That's what I just did. I just tested. Yeah. Um, okay. And it's a it's a one line command. You have a file you have a file that has a good pull secret in it, and then there's a one line command that you run and it updates it, and it goes and updates it throughout the cluster. Okay. I think so you're can gonna you update it afterwards. Like after you after you're hung. Yeah, that, that should uh, be possible. If MCD is crash looping, we should be able to SSH on the node, replace the kubelets. Uh, pull secret and proceed with it. Yeah, I tried it and I don't know if I, I did something matter. wrong. Yeah. yeah. So quick, quick question. Um, mm -hmm. Is this something, and, and maybe Joseph can answer for me. Um, I'll suggest that Joseph, is this something that we should, with the release, put in a blog post, um, like which, which is the stable Fedora core OS and this pull secret, or is there a note mm -hmm. somewhere in the issues with this release that has this information in it so that um, people I who are coming to it cold know about it? I immediately uh, created a blog post after um, Vadim wrote that in the mailing list. Okay, so you've already done it. I don't even, I haven't even looked. And um, Yeah, for, for the Fedora core is version, not for the fake, um, fake pull secret. Yeah. So I, for I, the FCOS thing, though, it looks like the backport request has been verified and is basically being prioritized to be pushed out. So uh, I don't know whether it will last the week. Really, that, that's if they decide to prioritize, you know, pulling in an updated Podman and then just recomposing March the March update. I don't know if it matters anymore after that point. Well, it's still good to have, you know, the OC piece working properly with a with a good, you know, fake key in there. So I think no, that no, no, the, the pod... fake key I'm talking about, the Podman yeah. one is the is the one yeah. I'm like I don't think it's worth actually doing anything if it gets fixed within like three to five days. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, it's still. I, I mean, yeah. If, 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 Joseph, thank you for doing the blog post. And I think Timothy is on here too. So you're hearing, um, and Timothy, I think, is the person who um, is here listening for the Fedora Core OS um, engineering side of things, if I'm correct. Yep, I'm here. Yep. Yeah, so you're, you're hearing some of our pain here. So, um, and I think this was Maybe. part of the conversation last time too, is how how we get flagged when these things, and, and I'm, you know, do, Vadim, just from my understanding, when did you figure out that the new Podman was, what was the communication around this Podman 3 thing? How did that work? Did you find out um, just when you did the, the build or did you know about it coming down the pike? We knew this um, like about a week ago because what we do is we pick a version of the Dark OS in our installer. Any API installation is bound to a particular version. The UPIs have the liberty of using whatever. So what we do is um, Fedora Core OS has a tracker and they post when they release a new stable version. Usually at this point I bump the installer, make a build and make a test run. And that usually either passes uh, perfectly and then I just keep an eye on nightlies. Or uh, it horribly fails and I reported it back to Fedora Core stable, uh, to Fedora Core folks saying that stable is broken for some reason and so on. Yeah. Um, sometimes some users are faster than I am and they report issues, just like in this case, it was reported right in the middle when I was building a new installer. Um, so I think we got this pretty well covered on this front. Uh, in 4.8, there would be a command in the installer which says, which particular release and what are the boot images for the tested release we have been using in our CI. So that should make things uh, much easier. We have a similar... Go ahead. We have we had similar uh, lots of problems with OVN uh, Kubernetes or OVS. 
and during 4.6 and 4.7 and I'm not pretty sure that everything of that is already solved. Um, I was absolutely happy we had a we had a, a deep dive session with Vadim and John to find this random Mac uh, problem and finally we solved it with the help of the network manager guys thanks to them uh, and I tried out I, I, I have a script with uh, uh, that does a redo a reloop uh, sorry reboot loops all three minutes and I was happy to not see this problem again but uh, I, I saw a new problem where only after a while only two network interfaces were available and reboots uh, did not fix that and we had to delete um, a database of open vSwitch and also remove all connections uh, with the NM CLI to fix that. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't know how major is this OVN Kubernetes or is it mostly related to OVS that we use uh, such a new version in, in Fedora? I don't get it because in, in OpenShift, uh, OVN Kubernetes is, uh, it's, uh, GA. Why, why do we see that mostly in, in Fedora Chorus? Is it, yeah. It seems to be a 4.6 issue, because um, I haven't seen that on 4.7, um, but it looked like it was pretty you know, pretty common in 4.6. I remember seeing it on 4.6. But uh, um, also, I, I, I know that we do this all the time, but I want to give kudos to Vadim again, because he is a very patient man. Um, even when it's late, as it's like, he's very kind. Um, <laughs> and I need to remember that he's five hours ahead of me. <laughs> I think that that's uh, Vadim you, Vadim. is made of awesome. That is <laughs> that is the thing. Vadim is made yeah. of awesome. He does everything great, and he's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, absolutely. We're, we're lucky to have him. So I'm, the the reason Timothy that I, that I said that about um, uh, hearing some of our pain around um, the Fedora CoreOS stuff, and maybe it's um, maybe I'm butting my head in. But we talked last time about this three tiered approach to um, releasing Fedora CoreOS. And I'm just wondering if um, if the needs and want, how, how the needs and wants and the, even the, the awareness of what's going into Fedora CoreOS, um, how we can better, I mean, so it doesn't, doesn't land like this on us um, so as often as it does. And, and if what we, what could we could be doing better to communicate with the Fedora CoreOS group. Um, and I think, Vadim, you do an awesome job. That's it. But I, I also, each release, there's, it seems like there's always something, little thing. Um, and uh, I'm wondering how we, what we need to do to be more maybe involved um, in the Fedora CoreOS decision-making tree around what goes into Fedora CoreOS, if there's something we should be doing from our point of view. Do you, know, you have thoughts on that? I don't think we need some active investigation or constant pressure on Fedora Core's folks to look into kitty bugs because what we can do is we can have more testing and we can always fall back to any particular stable release we can do. Yeah. Um, we are keeping an eye on what's happening in Fedora Core's land and I think we're mostly aware of any changes coming. For instance, for 8 is already using Fedora 34, we would need to do a few small changes, so that upgrade should be, shouldn't be that painless as the previous one. Shouldn't be that painful, rather. Um, I sure hope they're not less pain, that they're not less painless. It's not more pain. It's gonna be painful in some other way, some other new fancy way, I'm sure. Yeah. It just makes us more familiar with CoreOS. Well, I think testing is a, a really, um, core thing is to get, pardon the pun, is to get things um, tested out of the other streams, uh, Fedora CoreOS streams. And I think if we can make it easy to sort of do a testing matrix. So for example, um, last week I just incorporated um, uh, some functionality into my script that pulls from the different streams the latest release and incorporates that into an OKD build. If we could do that across the board and then basically have a matrix of, okay, here's this release, here's this version of OKD, the, the community could be able to test these things quite easily. We just needed the same thing on 
the other platforms. So I got vSphere covered, but we need something similar, uh, some sort of testing matrix basically for the other platforms. Maybe it's also, I, I have seen uh, in other open source projects, sometimes that they publish their test setup and uh, um, um, down to some uh, configuration switches so people see what the test environment was. And uh, maybe we should do something similar so people can compare their, their results more easily. In addition what, to, to that, what you said, Jamie, I can absolutely underline that. So, yeah, I, I would just, from my point of view, it, sound, it sounds like there's mechanisms in place, Vadim, that you have to, you know, for awareness and, and we can use the early release. I was just wondering from a community liaison role, what, what we should be doing um, with the Fedora CoreOS um, and if there's more resources that we should be from OKD putting on Fedora CoreOS or, you know, what else we can do to help uh, here. So from the Fedora CoreOS side, I would say um, the, um, the easiest way to make sure that we are not breaking OKD is to make sure that we are testing the, the thing that you use. So here apparently that was one of the features of Podman and we are probably not testing that right now in the Fedora CoreOS CI. And uh, if we have a test for that, then it won't break. So, and we won't release with that broken. So uh, I'll say, um, I don't know, how much of the coverage we have regarding Bondman and things like that in, in Fedora Core CI. But um, yeah, if specific things are really important for KD, um, then we could have that in Fedora Core CI. Yeah. And there's already an initiative to bring more tests, uh, more application tests uh, to Fedora Core S, but this is definitely a work in progress. Yeah, and, and it's also resourcing too, so. Bug. Vadim is asking, which bug could be prevented by publishing this sensitive information? And No, we're, we're discussing how the level of how much information should we publish about our CI, because all the configuration on for AWS, GCP, and anything else is covered. vSphere. Um, I could contact the vSphere cluster owners so that we could publish which setup we're testing, but as far as I know, there are multiple of them. For instance, at least 4.6.5 and 4.6.7 and 7.0. I'm not entirely sure which uh, setup our CI is running at, but before we could publish that information, we would need to know What's the what's the purpose? Which bugs could be prevented by publishing this? And should we increase the CI uh, coverage or the community coverage is more more valuable in that case? So um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking that we shouldn't push on CI too much. We have a lot automated, mm -hmm. and I would rather have UPI installs covered than all of them are snowflakes anyway. So. If we manage to find a bunch of problems with uh, promiscuous mode, we shouldn't be adding a test which verifies uh, this because we will have this covered when community tests anyway, and their results are always evolving and changing in time, so we always know that these are always active, valid, and <coughs> somehow relevant. Yeah, we, we experienced that there are a few situations um, where you can find lots of problems, like reboots. Yeah, uh, it can it can take ten reboots until an error shows up. But if if it happens, you you have uh, no. Uh, I mean, if if it happens on a master, then you have a uh, degraded um, etcd. Yeah, and don't maybe don't see it. And if the second time the second master fails, it's the same problem after. 20 configuration chains of machine configs later, you always have this reboots, and if it happens on a master, the second one, and it fails, your cluster is down. That's, that's what happened to us, and it was completely random that we saw that because we didn't, did not know that promiscuous mode was on. 
yeah, a colleague of mine has enabled it because of a cube word tests months ago. Maybe we don't know it, but uh, we stumbled in lots of problems. And um, I think I know that you say a, a test has to uh, produce a, a deterministic result. Yeah, absolutely correct. But with these reboots, you find so much. You can find much so uh, can find so much effects. I get it. Um, what we have instead is, at least for OCP, for sure, we have endurance test, meaning a cluster is left for like a couple of days at least, I think even for weeks, with um, effectively serial tests running here and there that includes upgrades, that includes running payloads there, that actually includes restarts and so on. Um, it's not a standard job, so I don't have a good definition for that. But what we could have is a similar test for OKD. That might be very valuable. Um, yeah, yes. we could we could work on that. Um, if we need, if we could dedicate one of the community's clusters to that and try a similar schema to find out more bugs, that would be incredibly useful because all our vSphere clusters are shared. There is no way we can dedicate one vSphere cluster for OKD test and watch how and how badly does it hit the actual cluster? We would always have noisy neighbors. We would always have various results coming. Um, that really complicates the debugging, but kind of a fuzzing test for um, the installation very useful. Jamie? I feel like this is pointing back to the need for a testing matrix and a resource uh, identification matrix. So. Who do we have in the community that can run stuff on a vSphere cluster uh, to do testing? Who has access to AWS resources to do testing, et cetera? Ultimately, I don't think this is going to come from internal to Red Hat's resources. I think it's going to come from the community. So we have to identify who has what that they can contribute to it and then pull those folks together. We did last year, was it, have sort of the vSphere or maybe early this year? the sort of vSphere folks meet up together uh, mm -hmm. and hammer stuff out. I think that would be good for the other platforms and identify, okay, who has resources that they can make available to test certain things repeatedly? And just to underline um, what Joseph said, you know, I ran into an issue with uh, the latest 4.7 the other night that it's something between um, FCOS and OKD where if, the FCOS um, unit fails, the OKD install on the node succeeds. If the uh, FCOS unit succeeds uh, and doesn't error out, then actually it's it, the opposite happens with OKD. So for but things like that, it's hard to duplicate, right? So we need to be able to say, okay, I'm having this problem. Who has a vSphere that can test this to see if you can duplicate it as well? So how we do that in terms of narrowing communication, I don't know, but I think the first thing would be is to get everyone in the working group or external folks to actually say, okay, yes, I have a vSphere that I can test things on, or I have an AWS account that I can test things with. Yeah, then we can great. have people meeting up together to, to okay. repeat things over and over. Think, think about the problem with the random MAC address. <laughs> uh, if, not, if not John had uh, raised his hand that he also has seen it in Kai Uwe Rommel, yeah, I, I was completely, I, I, I thought I was crazy yeah, and seeing uh, ghosts and white mice until uh, John has said uh, he has seen the same. Sometimes it's rather crazy yeah. to, to uh, debug things if you are the only one who sees that. Yeah. Great, so, great uh, idea. So just sort of to, to pull this back, tease, tease something out of this here, the, the vSphere group, meeting that we had um, I thought was really good and we didn't really I don't think we repeated it I think we only did it once maybe twice um, and maybe trying to do this test matrix external resources for vSphere even though El, uh, Mike you're saying there's vSphere has too many options um, uh, that's just life um, maybe we should try and uh, I'll say just doing doing it for vSphere creating the test matrix, seeing who has a couple of resources, because I mean, I'm not going to say it. it's always vSphere, but um, it's usually John Fortin or um, Joseph that's bringing these up. And maybe that um, 
maybe if we reinvigorated or remet as the vSphere one, figured out a testing matrix um, scenario for vSphere, um, we could um, flush out what this actually would look like um, to have external resources in the community testing um, on a regular cadence each of these releases. That that I think is 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 would be incredibly valuable, and and I know we could do it. For, because we have enough vSphere people here. Um, we might not be able to do it for AWS and GKE and, or wherever else um, people are running, but, um, but I think we have enough vSphere interest to do something like that. So that, that's how I would capture this conversation and try and move it forward if, if people are willing. Um, and I'll, you know, like with the docs meeting, um, take that on and try and set up another call because there's just how many days in the week. And since we all know that Joseph can meet an hour earlier, um, maybe we'll do that um, an hour earlier <laughs> and do the vSphere before this. So, I, and I know I, I probably took us off on a tangent on this, so I apologize um, because I, and so I'm gonna park that there and maybe Jamie and Joseph and John pull you in a, on a conversation around that and anyone else who's a vSphere-ish person, um, which is pretty much all of you. Um, pull that conversation aside and figure out what that would look like. What I wanted to also talk about and um, is last weekend's, was it last weekend or the weekend before's um, OKD workshop, which I wanted to thank everybody from Vadim to Christian to um, Jamie and um, uh, Shri and everyone else who's on the call who's done, you know, did amazing things, including a few folks who aren't here today. Um, that was wonderful. I, I hope you saw, I put a blog post both on okd.io about it with links, um, posted it to the Google group with the videos, and we also put one up on openshift.com. Um, um, so hopefully the word gets out a little bit wider and people use and see these um, videos. And thank you, Jamie, for um, chopping up the two hour long sessions because my um, server died and I ran out of space and memory to, to render those videos. So thanks, and I think I figured out my problem, Jamie, So, but I'll still use you as a resource for that. Um, that, that said, I would like to pause for a minute and get some feedback on what worked and what didn't work on um, that um, workshop for us. Um, and I know someone mentioned the screen size um, in Hopin was kind of small for a few of the workshops. I think that was um, Charo's comment, and he's not here because he's had a family emergency. So. Um, I do know how to fix that. Um, that's to take your faces off when you're presenting in hop in, then the screen is full. And if we do that, then the screen would be full and it wouldn't be as, as blurry and tiny text as, as it was on some of the video output. So uh, I, know, I know that one issue, but I, I'm gonna stop talking for a minute and ask people for their feedback on it and then move to next steps. What are we, you know, where are we at with the documentation and documentation strategies, what I'd like to take up some time today talking about. So I'm gonna, what did people think of the workshop? Would you repeat it? There were 40 people and I was surprised that um, very much of them use OKD in production. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'd agree with that. I, I think there is a large number of people out there using OKD in production that are quiet, that are the lurkers, and that this was a way to tease out some of those people and um, see if we can get them to participate. So that was one of my goals. Um, I would have, as I said repeatedly, would have liked to see about 100 people come, um, but I think we, I also had some family emergencies before and I didn't do as much to promote it as I would have liked to um, normally. So. Um, but I think it was good to work out the kinks of hop in before mm -hmm. we do it again. Other thoughts, folks? I think one of the things that um, we might want to do next time we do this is have a clearer sense of um, who's going to say, who's going to speak about what and how many tracks we really need and everything. I think we sort of, we got it together at the end and it, it ended up flowing nicely, but I felt like there was some pain points and folks figuring out what our real intent was and who really wanted to talk about this and getting people to, to, to get into slots that we needed people to talk about stuff with. So maybe that's just a, a question of timing. Like if we're gonna plan one of these, maybe uh, you know, earlier on in the process say, okay, identify 
who is going to speak about what. And if we don't have someone for that, reach out right away so that it's not a couple days like just before the event and stuff like that. Yeah. And that's not a criticism of any individual or anything. That's just the process. Yeah. yeah. Well, if anyone here on the call who um, is here for the first time who came to that workshop, Curious about that. I'm not. What I'm not sure that it did was draw more people into the working group. It may have gotten us more lurkers, um, and and that's not meant to be derogatory. If you're out there listening and lurking, that's a good thing to do because we know the content's getting listened to. But um, trying to get, from my point of view, trying to get more people, external people from Red Hat to contribute to these conversations um, and to be resources on, on different topics um, and is, is one of my goals. It may not be the goal of everybody else. So um, that for me, that felt like something that we quite didn't quite manage to do. And again, um, I also think that I didn't quite do enough um, outreach because of some of the stuff on there. But as, as Philip points out, one of the things that I always console myself with is the videos because it's the long tail of people watching this content. The same is true with the OKD marathon that we had um, the previous year, which is this in my head is sort of the follow on to that um, thing. So I would definitely want to do it again. Um, but I think um, the next phase of the what's next step is, um, yeah, and and rebroadcasting it over all of it. We, we could have done that pretty easily. I think that would have been easy, but asking someone to do that on their Saturday is always um, problematic too. So I have to be cognizant of that. But rebroadcasting on, on the live streams might have picked up a bit, a few more people. I'm not sure. Diane, what you, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, no, I just want like, since you were talking about the broadcasting, I was thinking like simulcasting, cause like hop in is great, but like, I think if you talk to Chris, you know, like having a broadcast on Twitch and YouTube, like using their live broadcasting at the same time would make it accessible to like people who are searching for content to watch on any given Saturday. And I think you have a good chance of like getting it in front of people who are basically, you know, stream clicking and just looking for content to watch. So I, mean, I, I think it's like a possibility to get it in front of more eyes basically. Yeah, the, the, the reality is um, by doing it in tracks, you couldn't, simultaneously do the four tracks. That was one of the limitations. And also to be quite honest, OpenShift TV doesn't have that big of a, an audience yet. It's coming, you know, it will come. Um, for me, it's always including with the stuff that I do in briefings and stuff that I do on OpenShift TV, it's always about the long tail watchers, um, the people who watch the videos afterwards. But that brings me to the documentation because the videos are great, but without the good documentation um, and the follow up, um, with the documentation and the work that Mike, you did, and Jamie and everybody else getting that um, taxonomy in place um, in your repo um, was awesome. I'm wondering what's, what the status of that is right now, and maybe um, if Jamie and, and Mike, if you could take a minute and say, you know, what's missing? What, what do you want to do with that repo's worth of content, um, and where, sh where should that be next? You want to go ahead? Lead on. Uh, either way, either you can go first, Jamie. Sure. So I think, you know, I, and I regrettably couldn't make it to the meeting last week because I showed up early uh, for the documentation. Um, I think, you know, and some of this was covered in the meeting is that there's been a lot of duplication of effort um, in terms of the guides that were created last year, some of the stuff that was created this year, et cetera. I don't know, and Mike can speak to this more, if Mike's repo is ultimately the landing place where we want people um, mm -hmm. for that type of stuff, right? So eventually we want to move it. So we need to clear a path that's sort of more directly to it. Um, I, I, my sense is that we are getting better at writing documentation, but it's sort of insular. What I'm seeing is that a lot of questions that we had at the workshop was stuff that wasn't covered in the documentation that comes from people out in um, the world. And so it might be helpful for us to come up with a way of gleaning questions out of the community and then writing documentation based on our answers. And, you know, I had done some discussion of that and blog posts, right. 
and done some discussion of that um, early on with Vadim and a couple other folks about, okay, what are some common questions to put in the, the FAQs and stuff like that? Um, but it might just be like committing one of us, maybe we rotate once a week, look through the channels of Slack, find out what people are asking repeatedly, and then create documentation on it. You know, and if we have a rotation of people, so-and-so is responsible today or this week or whatever, we'll always have someone um, getting that's culling that stuff from questions and then either incorporating it into existing documentation or creating new documentation. So I guess, again, I'm defining process, right? So we should come up with a process, I think, for gleaning questions from the community that we can answer. Yeah. So, and, and, and my question to, to the two of you and probably anyone else who wants to pipe in is um, the status, because a couple of things were still stubs in Mike's repo, um, like links out to Charo's thing and, and the home lab stuff, um, were all stubs and, or pointers to places. Um, and I honestly haven't looked recently at the, at the hierarchy. What it, wh where are we at in terms of getting enough content um, to move it maybe, and I, I've been suggesting in the okd.io repo somewhere, um, because I have an ulterior motive. Um, always there's an ulterior with Diane. The three home lab ones, Shree's, um, Vadim's um, version, and um, Craig Robinson's, um, home labs is a huge topic for developers and DevOps types. Um, when we write blog posts on OpenShift.com, it's in the t always in the top 10. Craig Robinson's, the re remix that I did of Craig Robinson's one that links out to his Medium post is one of the highest hit things on OpenShift.com in terms of blogs and creating awareness for OKD. So my goal really in moving this repo over into a real place um, is first is to take those home lab ones and tease them out into a full-blown blog post to promote OKD and awareness of OKD and more, hopefully drive more participants and out more people using it in production, not just their home labs too, but really to drive more engagement in this community. So my, my hope is that that repo content, at least the home lab stubs gets filled out. Did that happen over the past couple of weeks or is it still in the same state it was? There's, there are still stubs. Charo's stuff hasn't been moved into a singular page or anything like that. I, I haven't pushed it because my thought was that we were going to have the conversation about duplication of effort and what goes where first, but maybe that's just maybe you and I looking at this differently or, or other people looking at this differently. I was sort of hoping that we would have that conversation of, before we move stuff over, but it sounds like you want to just at least get the home lab stuff over I, I... And, and then like hammer out what goes where. I'd first. like to lift the whole repo from Mike's into OKD.io. Um, yeah, that's, I don't have a problem with contributing. That's not a big deal. Yeah, to move it over and and then push um, Shri is on the call and um, Vadim maybe to do a little write up on Neil's on the call um, and Charo to move so that even if it's a remix of their and a pointer out to their blog post, at least there's a blurb about it there for each of the home labs. Before I do a blog post, um, a major one on OKD.io with Joseph's um, blog or one on um, developers.redhat.com or on openship.com. So I'd like them not, I'd like to not be pointing to Mike's repo, not that I don't love Mike and everything that's going on there. No, it's fine. Yeah, it's totally cool. We could, we could yeah. immediately put that to, um, to OKDIO in, uh, in blocks because there you have tags, you have a search. I mean, uh, you can group uh, articles together. We can make a, create a home lab tag and write blog posts. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's still, everything is still in, in, in Git repos. Yeah, if people want to have something, they can uh, create pull requests. But I think the entry, if you search for OKD, OKDAO is one of the first hits. And I think the simple, the simple idea is that if I go here and see, they have a blog or a forum, we don't have a forum, that I want to have to look there and not uh, follow a chain of of uh, yeah repositories where I have to search. Uh, it's yeah, not so it's I'm, not I'm, so easy. I'm separating out two things. Before we write blog posts, Joseph, is to move what's in Mike's repo into OKD.io's repo, 
and then write blog posts that point to that as opposed to hopping through that loops and things. And that, that's, right. that's my goal. Well, I'll take as yeah. an action item then whipping everyone together to get those stubs done and get this and get content where the stubs are and then do a pull request to the OKD. To repo. merge it all in. Let me follow up with status then and where we got to after that. Because like last Tuesday we met up and we talked about a bunch of action items to do on the repo. Since then, we put a template in there. We started to, we changed the, there were two bare metal directories. We changed one of them to be called a home lab now. And that's where we've put, you know, Vadim and Shree's instructions are there. I've got a PR open to rename the directory that Charos is in to single node, which we had agreed on. We wanted to have a distinction between single node and home lab. Um, I, I pinged Jamie, I was just, and, and Charo, I was just waiting to hear back from them before like approving that. Um, Eric was able to help me out a bunch and we got the template merged, uh, I think today. I also went back and redid all the, the like the IPI defaults. Uh, I put those in the format of the template. The next steps that I was going to do was to rewrite the outstanding, um, you know, like Shree's and Vadim's and Charo's. I was going to rewrite those and format them under the template so that they at least looked similar, even if the deployment section, in the case of Charo's, linked out to an external, you know, his page, we would kind of like fill it up a little bit so that it looked like that. So we're kind of like most of the way where we talked about at the last docs meeting where we wanted to be. I'm yep. totally okay to contribute that repo to a different organization if we want to have it, um, you know, somewhere under OKD. And I think, you know, lastly, in terms of like what the future of that repo is, I just want to talk about the past of that repo. We had originally, and when I say we, I'm talking about the internal like cloud infrastructure team, which is who I work with. Like we work on a lot of these bits around like the machine API operator and things that interact with the cloud layer. And so we had originally created that repo because we wanted to start cataloging all the different uh, options that we were seeing people like deploying with so that we could start to get a picture of what, what kind of various deployments were looking like. And a lot of this was around vSphere activity because like internally, and I'll just, I'll call back to something Diane was talking about earlier, like, Having this group do vSphere work is amazing. Like getting more community interaction from vSphere would be totally amazing because I think internally we have a very strong grasp on like AWS and GCP and Azure and, you know, some of the other public clouds like, you know, even like Alibaba and like, uh, you know, Metal, Metal Equinix and stuff like that. Like we're getting a handle on those clouds fairly easily, but we see a ton of people showing up who want to use vSphere. And I think the popularity of vSphere in the community um, is so large that it's difficult for us as a product team to actually like service all the requests that are happening around vSphere. So it's like, it's very easy for us to do AWS and GCP and we have like a good handle on those things. But vSphere, because of the explosion of options for the way that you can deploy it, becomes very difficult for our team to, like, uh, you know, just manage all the bugzillas that can come in. So, I, you know, huge plus one to that effort. But this was kind of why we originally started to try and record these various deployment options, because we wanted to start to get a handle on just how many different ways you could deploy things especially on, on things like vSphere. So that, that's kind of like a little window into why we started it. Where it ends up going in the future, you know, if you want to use it for a collection of deployment guides, um, I think that'd be great. Eric had a great su suggestion in one of the PR, uh, the template PR, you know, the notion of we might have an install guide that's kind of like a base for a certain thing, like let's say AWS, you know, UPI install guide or something. And that would be a base template that others could refer to. So if you were just doing something like, hey, I'm installing to AWS, I'm using UPI, but I'm also using a cluster-wide proxy. You know, you could have a guide that would say like, yeah, point to the base guide, which has all the basic information. All it needs to do is add this little extra blurb. So I think there's this idea of like modularity to the guides as we start to build them up. So those were some of the ideas that we had talked about um, you know, over the course of like the week and the PR reviews that went back and forth. Yeah, and and it's good. I mean, I, I'm totally thrilled with the vSphere uh, content and the community that's coming around vSphere and and gelling too. I think that's going to be huge. 
for us. And it's one of the big things that we can offer back to the engineering teams is that the community will will help you know parse out what's going on with this year and the different releases. And I think that's a huge selling point when I have to go back and Vadim has to go back and get engineering resources put on OKD. If we say, not only are we helping you with the future of RHEL, but we're also helping manage all of this vSphere stuff. So when you think of uh, me and, and other folks internal to Red Hat who have to argue and fight for resources for this project, and uh, th these are the things, these are the arguments that um, we, we have to keep um, doing. And, and it's not that we argue, yeah, it's just, it's the, the pull and tug for resources is, is, is strong, right. is strong. <laughs> and, so, and I'm um, pushing, I'm trying to push the OKD message internally as well, because like what I'm trying to take back to our team and the stakeholders that we have involved in like, especially the Bugzilla process around what we're doing, like I'm trying to point out how valuable the OKD community has been, you know, for us in terms of, okay, yeah, there is this easing of pressure around the bug reporting and fixing that's happening in the community. So I'm trying to, to push that message internally and I think it's, you know, it's getting uptick from engineers that I talk to at least. Yeah, I think I think we've we've got a good case and, and it's working and, and Red Hat's supportive. So it's, it's not that, it's just, you know. Um, it's making sure through. everyone is bought in to recognize the value that's happening. Some yeah. people may have it, but not necessarily everybody knows, yeah. right? Like so, another um, subtle effect of what we're doing here is we're making it easier for OKD to move faster. Like, yeah. because things are actually happening and people are actually using it, and we're plugged into Fedora Core OS rather than using CentOS or RHEL Core OS or whatever, we also have the opportunity to be able to do things like test new modes, see how well defaults and, and opinions that OpenShift is trying out, whether they work out in practice or not. Um, building, you know, those sorts of things that uh, I don't think there's another avenue in which that could be done. Like, I think CRC would be in a much worse spot uh, today if it weren't for, for a lot of the things that we've been trying to do and figure out. Okay. It, so there's kind of another that? angle to this too, Neil, which is, you know, that like, as the community here is doing a lot of work and starting to do more work, like one of the things that I'm trying to do internally is change our language from, you know, in the past it's all been like, we all talk about OpenShift, 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 every tool we're creating is OpenShift this, OpenShift that. And what I'm trying to do is shift the discussion internally to say, let's look, if we want OKD to be this upstream, you know, this mythical upstream to OpenShift or to OCP, let's adjust our language and start talking about OKD. Like if I'm gonna make a new tool, I don't wanna call it the OpenShift this, that, the other thing. I want it to be the OKD this, that, the other thing, because I wanna push towards the community first. So that's another message that I think you know, we're trying to get in internally and it's just, it's an uphill battle right now. Yeah. So I'm gonna circle back um, to documentation because this, you know, just so we go back. So what the, and, and as I said in the chat, I can be patient. I don't need this repo to move over right away and I don't need to do the home lab update right away. I know everybody's busy. Um, I'd like to get Craig Robinson to do an update to, on his, and, and I'll have to reach out because he's not on the call right now. To, and if you're listening, it's Craig, and I haven't. And um, let me know what the possibility is of um, getting him to write up the um, the steps for the the update of the from. I think he did 4.5 in his last home lab um, write up, and now it's 4.7 or 8.7 um, that he did the demo with. So um, so that that would be you know get that so i'd like to get it to a point in your repo because i know it's easier to, and quicker for you to do stuff over there um and and maybe we'll wait till next week and in the docs meeting and have another conversation and see where we're at and then after that do the poll i think the other thing and jamie keeps harping on it um and i and i know um and i am and i'm also going to say right up front i am not a docs specialist i'm i just no good docs when I see it. Um, and I'm also not a process specialist. So if there are other people on the call who are docs people, and um, I know our one person who, Amy, who was on had to leave at 1030. So, um, and she does all the RDO docs. But if there's someone else who wants to take on um, building a cohesive docs strategy and process, um, I'm, I'm, I'd be thrilled to work with you on that. And I can see Jamie raising his hand. And Jamie, keep, you keep raising your hands, editing my videos, um, editing, you know, do this. But I think we do need to step back 
and figure out um, what we have, like an audit of what we have in the system right now. I love the idea, Jamie, about the FA, you know, sort of the FAQ um, stuff from the, whatever the current conversation is. Um, one of the things, Joseph, though, that I would coach that I know because I'm old as dirt um, is that documentation by blogging doesn't, it isn't sustainable. Everything goes out of date, just like, you know, Craig Robinson's 4.5 home lab blog. So what I'm trying to figure out is how to do documentation um, so that we have this current FAQ stuff coming out. And so each release gets, you know, what was the issue with this release? Gets a blog like you've done, Joseph, um, uh, as well as what the current conversations are going on, like, you know, if OVN is a big thing or LibVirt is a big thing this week, to just have those topical things, but things that need to be docs, where they should live, because we have docs.okd.io. Um, we have, in, and we have these guides now, and try and create a cohesive strategy for that. Uh, that would be, um, you know, as I always say, my fantasy land, where, you know, fantasy island, if we had time. So, Jamie, if you want to write up a, a doc or something to share next week in between all of the other things you're doing at UMesh, because um, I think even if it's just a stub of a doc that gives us something to start from to work with. And, and I will take any proposals. And there's a lot of people who are very quiet right now on this um, call. Um, the usual suspects are talking. If any of you um, have experience or have people working on your teams who have experience with docs that you can drag into this conversation, it would be lovely to have more docs help. So, um, but I don't want, I know Jamie, you already raised your hand about the testing stuff um, too, a testing matrixes. But I think if we, if I do something like continue the docs meetings every other week and then come up with, we had talked about office hours, um, community office hours on a Thursday, but if maybe we rejig that to be every bi-weekly office hours and on the other week do a vSphere group, um, which may end up being the same thing as community office hours, but it's the same people. But that regular cadence of this week we're going to talk about vSphere and testing on vSphere and the agenda is about, you know, external resources and how we can do that and communicate our results back effectively and then have office hours on Thursdays as well. And use OpenShift TV. You know, I, I get that. I really do that. But I, you know, and I think the other thing that is really important because the, it's the long tail watching of this content um, that people are doing. I get more feedback from people in strange parts of the universe and different time zones that, you know, they're watching. I never think anyone ever watches these recordings um, until I don't upload the last three um, and get behind. And then someone knocks on my door and says, hey, you know, um, we're watching this stuff. We're watching you. So to the lurkers out there, we love you too. Um, keep on lurking. So I don't know, if, Vadim, if you have any other thoughts about that to close that. On the docs part, no, not really. There is an infinite field of improvement we can do there, yeah. unfortunately. It always is. And docs make a community is what I, I kind of say. And um, until we have a good doc strategy, um, we're always going to be in this recursive loop of having these conversations about stuff. So I think it's time and um, it would be lovely to do. So on that note, is there anything else we missed today that we should have done? Any other feedback? Uh, John had a question. In yeah. So Vadim and I were talking earlier on one of our Slack things, and the question we raised was where are we tracking bugs or whatever you want to call them well enough, um, or do we need something else in order to track bugs or to-dos or something else? Um, is that a is that a fair statement, Vadim, or restatement? Yeah, it just feels that we are misusing the bug tracker for all things tracking. Perhaps we should have some kind of a to-do list. Uh, GitHub has this board. Maybe we should use it for non-technical parts like which bugs go into the next release. Uh, GitHub is milestones. Should we be using them? Um, 
should we be using something like a blog? It's a pretty much open discussion. We probably should use mailing list for that. But any ideas how to improve our workflow uh, are greatly appreciated because, well, there is always a room for improvement and I'm not very happy with what we have right now. There are lots of things the community could participate, but probably it's locked behind all the labels that we use for issue tracking and things like that. Uh, a lot of folks are asking for a good first issue to get started. We don't have that because that includes getting hands dirty, but we have a lot of jobs and things to do to clean up documentation, to clean up issues that are active, to clean up a list of releases we have. Um, and probably backtracking is not a great place to discuss that. So overall workflow improvement, probably a good topic to, to have a discussion upon. Yes, oh. absolutely. Yep, I agree. And, and I'd rather and not Slack's not a great place for it either. Yeah. <laughs> no. All right. So we'll have another call next week on Docs on Tuesday. And what I'll try and do through the mailing list is maybe kick off the um, vSphere conversation the following week on the Thursday, see if we can get a group uh, meeting going on that. And um, yeah, OK. And now I can see in the chat um, discourse, matrix, or one of the bazillion other things that are out there um, hosting our own stuff. Um, I'm kind of fine with that, but I still don't want to lose the conversation that raises our visibility up in OpenShift-Dev and Kubernetes. I think when I think our presence there is really important to, um, to keep the conversation about OpenShift open um, and, and having an open source angle to an awareness of that people are using OKD on the part of everybody in the universe, not just Red Hatters, but the rest of the universe that's lurking in there. So, you know, yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm leaning towards staying where we are, but, um, well, I think Slack is good for for what we've been using it for to an extent. Your know, questions like, you know, we've run through kind of debugging sessions, you know, and threads and stuff. Um, but I'm not sure if that's a good play for we'd have a to do list, you know, yeah. of things that we want to do as a community. So, I mean, I I I know Neil doesn't like Slack, but uh, um, you know, I think that there is a good community there, and a lot of people watch it. But you know, I'm I'm up for other things too. But I think I agree with Vadim. You know, we need to have Something where we can <laughs> minus one, yeah. where we yeah. can you know kind of track that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, not I'm not gonna. I, I'm just one voice, and, and I, I yeah. it's just just that. So and if the community wants that, I'm I'm fine with um, someone setting that up for us. Um, the other thing I think that we could use is that um, the thing that I use not to, to, to the agenda page, um, the projects page as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that's in GitHub and, and pretty public. But I don't think we have it in the right place because obviously not everybody can add to it um, because you don't have rights to do so. So maybe creating the projects page in the OKD.io repo um, that was public might be another alternative. Um, I'm, just, I'm just really loath to have to monitor yet another discussion forum. Um, and that's just me because I'm already on about 40 others, so, um, and, and, and if the community wants it and we can set it up and it, it get, it's useful, do it. Um, you have to turn off something for that. Create yeah. something new and turn off something that's not so useful. We're not turning off Slack anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah, not anytime I think it's soon. mostly, it's mostly just like, I think we need something that isn't GitHub issues for general purpose questions, so. Yeah. Yeah. Personally, I'm fine with a with a with like a separate GitHub that is specifically for that, a, um, a discourse, a separate channel on the Kubernetes Slack, whatever it might be. It just needs to be something we that isn't ask, overly technical. We could we could ask for ask.fedoraproject.org and discussions.fedoraproject.org. We could ask for OKD sections there that, because that might... the instance exists; it's already paid for, and 
you know, there's nothing wrong with using stuff that's already there that we have. Well, hold that thought because I have to kick you all out of here now because I have another meeting coming up in this same URL. Um, oh, and lovely. Let's have that discussion on what's available um, for this. And um, yeah, this is my public forum here for everything um, I do with OpenShift. So um, thank you for today. This was really good. Yeah, move this conversation over into the OKD Working Group mailing list and we will do that. And next week, look for an invite on a Thursday to a vSphere group um, and I've got to figure out which time slot, whether it's my 9 a.m. or this 10 a.m., so 1600 or 1700 UTC, but I'll put that question out on the mailing list um, and see what you can do and thank you everybody. Thursday doesn't work for Bruce, okay? Maybe Wednesday. We'll see what um, we can find and I will doodle it or something. All right. Take care, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Bye, Bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye, all. Bye.